smoothly, we can rely on God. It goes back to that confidence thing that was talked about in Sunday school. Having confidence in God. And then the end of this life will come sooner or later, won't it? I don't know anybody that's made it through life without dying. <laughs> and when it comes to be our time, we should have confidence. And by being born again, we can have that confidence. That when our eyes close that last time, we'll awake in God's sweet heaven. Amen. Confidence in God. Faith in God. Well, there's an old saying, you've heard it a lot of times, the rich get richer and the poor get <laughs> And when they say that, they're usually talking about money or politics. But I say it this morning in relationship to our Christianity, the rich get richer spiritually and the poor get poorer spiritually. And I'm glad you're here this morning because you've come together to hear the Word of God and to praise the Lord together hear the songs about Zion and to, uh, and to worship and get closer to God and to His people. And so those who are spiritually rich tend to be more spiritually rich after they've gathered together to corporately worship the Lord. And so I congratulate you on being here. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord. There's something sweet about worshiping the Lord together, isn't there? Huh? I just like it. Well... If you'll open your Bibles to Matthew chapter number 17, we're going to look at some fellows who got close to the Lord. Matthew chapter number 17. <coughs> Is everybody okay? Is it comfortable in here? I mean, I'm asking anybody but the ladies. They're always cold. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I know we keep it a little bit cooler than some of the ladies like it because I see they've brought their, they've brought their blankets and their pillows and, and I'm expecting to see sleeping bags, insulated sleeping bags showing up any time. <laughs> oh, is it okay? Does it feel okay to you? All right. Well, we, we do keep it a little bit cooler uh, maybe than you do in your living room. I don't know. But we try to keep it cool enough. It's... There's one thing for sure. You'll never get it the right temperature for everybody. It's either going to be too hot or too cold or something. I mean, it just can't be perfect for everybody. But we try to keep it a little cooler uh, because it kind of helps us to stay more alert and uh, we can listen better and we're awake better. And so if I see people nodding out and going over this way, I know we got to run the air conditioner down just a little bit lower. <laughs> we make it so cold you can't go to sleep. <laughs> All right. Matthew chapter number 17, and uh, we'll begin reading there in verse number 1. Just keep in mind that what comes before chapter 17 is chapter 16. And so I'm going to tell you a little about that in a minute. Verse number 1 in chapter 17 of Matthew. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart. Apart. This is not in the sermon, but just think about those, those kids that are going to camp this coming week. They're going to be apart. They're going to be apart, set apart from. Now, they're going to be with people. They'll be with some other people their age. They'll be with some preachers. They'll be with some teachers. and They'll, they'll be with people. They'll be with their counselors. So they're not alone, but they're going to be apart from the world for a week going to be apart away from their games and TV and, and uh, maybe, uh, maybe the neighborhood that they're so accustomed to. They're going to be apart from some of the routine things of the world that keeps people maybe distracted a little bit and they're going to be apart from all that and in a place where they'll have fun, they'll have games and all of that, but they're going to be apart from the worldly distractions so they can hear the Word of God when it's preached. And so we'll have a good time over there that, this week. I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to psych myself up because <laughs> I'm not used to sleeping anywhere but in my own bed. And so I'm going to be sleeping in a cabin with a bunch of stinky boys for a week. And so <laughs> uh, pray for me. And, but it's going to be a profitable time. I really believe that. I hope you'll pray for them. We're going to be apart. Jesus took these people, his disciples, apart. And verse 2 says, and he and was transfigured before them. 
and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as light. Well, don't you know that would be something to look upon, see the Lord Jesus glowing like a bright light? He was transfigured right in front of them. And behold, verse 3, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias. Elias is the Greek term for Elijah. Elijah of the Old Testament, the Hebrew. And so these guys who've been dead for a long time suddenly show up on this Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus and his three disciples. Verse 4, then Peter then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Now I want you to notice that particular phrase and maybe underline it because that's what we're going to talk about for a little while today. It is good to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles. Now the tabernacle would be like a little lean-to shed, like a, a little shed with bamboo stalks or corn stalks or thatch, just three tabernacles, maybe a little like a little brush arbor, something like that. The, the Hebrews had to use those things out there in the Middle East because the sun would get hot, and anything that would make a shade was uh, a pretty good asset to have. And he said, let's make three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias or Elijah. Verse 5, And he yet spake, behold, when, while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them. Some of you were touched when you heard the singing a little while ago. Some of you might have been touched by the Lord when we were going through those hymns that we sang today. Some of you may have been touched during the Sunday school hour. Touch of the Lord. Maybe you'll be touched in this part of the service or at the invitation. But it's good to be touched by the Lord. Don't you agree? I need His touch. And Jesus came and touched them, verse 7, and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. Father, we do pray that you would bless us today as we go into this hour of worship and, Lord, looking into your word. Lord, it's a preaching time, a teaching time, a learning time, a time to be touched. And, Lord, it won't happen unless you show up and touch us. Lord, make it a time of enriching, encouragement, enlightening. Lord, draw us close to thee. May we see some truths here today that will inspire and encourage us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, this same passage is somewhat duplicated in the rest of the Gospels. There's a, a little different uh, angle. The Gospels are all accurate. The Word of God is all accurate all the way through. It's just that the writer of one of the Gospels emphasizes one part of what he saw while another writer of another Gospel emphasizes another part that God wanted him to record in the Bible. And so there's no discrepancies in the Bible. Uh, for those people who say, well, I believe the Bible is written over such a long term of time and different men wrote it and so it's been changed and it's not accurate anymore, it doesn't mean anything, I would say to them, if you know of a mistake in the Bible, please show me. Now, I know there's some who claim they can show you a mistake in the Bible, but I've never had anybody to show me one. I believe the Bible is 100% God's Word and it's 100% accurate. And here in chapter 17, we just see one of the accounts of the four Gospels talking about this particular event that took place on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus was changed right in front of those three disciples. It's one of the most precious passages in the Bible. Here, what the Lord does is give these disciples a snapshot, and you and me, we get a little snapshot, a little vignette a little cameo appearance of Jesus in his kingdom. He's coming again one day 
and the rapture will take place. God's children will be caught away. The tribulation will end. The new kingdom for a thousand years will be set up with Jesus sitting on the throne on earth and then the eternal state sets in forever and ever and ever. And here we see just a little bitty snapshot, a cameo appearance, if you will, of Jesus being transformed as he will appear to us throughout eternity, the glorified Son of God. Oh, we need the snapshot. And this is a precious testimony of the Word of God to us today. So it's helpful to see what's happening in these verses. And if we look backward into chapter 16, remember I said a little while ago uh, that chapter 16 comes before 17? Well, what we see in chapter 16 is Jesus talking to his disciples about going to the cross. Now, can I tell you something here? Those disciples did not understand what Jesus was going to do. They didn't understand exactly what was going to happen by his death. They didn't know the burial and resurrection that was going to follow. He's trying to tell them in chapter 16 about that, but they didn't quite understand. And... Peter is rebuked. Well, let me, let me straighten this out. Actually, first, Peter rebukes Jesus in chapter 16 when Jesus says, I'm going to have to go down to Jerusalem and I'm going to be mistreated by the Jews and I'm going to die there and then be raised again. And Peter, the reason I know Peter didn't understand it besides the other passages of Scripture that say that they didn't understand it, Peter rebukes Jesus and says, Be it far from thee, Lord. We don't want to see you die. This is not going to happen. And then Jesus rebukes Peter. And what did he say? Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou savorest not the things of God, but things that be of the world. See, the world would say, Well, a good man like Jesus ought not to have to die. But the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And so Jesus understood that, that he would, as the sinless Son of God, have to go to the cross to pay for our sins. Peter didn't grasp it. And so they have that little exchange in chapter 16. And then <clears throat> notice the last verse of chapter 16 Verse 28, it says, Verily I say unto you, you're with me there, right? Uh, verse 28, Verily, Jesus says unto the disciples there, Verily I say unto you, There be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So he's saying to those disciples, Some of you are going to see, have a foretaste of this coming kingdom that I've been telling you about you're going to have a foretaste of that before you die. Well, he hasn't come to set up his kingdom yet, so we know that it's a preview of the kingdom that they have to see because those fellows all died, right? And so they saw something before they died that Jesus promised to them. They saw that little snapshot of Jesus being glorified on the Mount of Transfiguration, giving them a preview of that glorious reign that he will have someday. And we need a little glimpse of the future every once in a while. And so it says after six days uh, in Mark 9, that account of this same event in Mark chapter 9 and verse 2, it says after six days, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John into a high mountain and there Jesus was transfigured in their presence. Now, this might not seem something that strikes your fancy all at once, thinking this is not such a big deal. This was a big deal. They got to see something that you and I haven't ever seen. They got to see the Son of God transfigured before them. And uh, the and, there in chapter 17, verse 1, see that word and? The chapter starts off with and. That ties it together, that the little conjunction and ties it back to chapter 16. So he promises them the preview of the kingdom. You with me? And so then immediately in chapter 17, with, with six days having passed, they go with Jesus to this precious mount of transfiguration. And so I'm glad I don't have any problem believing in the 
the uh, virgin birth of Jesus Christ or the very vicarious death of Jesus dying in the place of our of ourselves for our sin. I don't have any problem believing in his victorious resurrection. He rose from the dead. I don't have any problem believing in his visible return that one day he will come back in the clouds of the sky just as he was seen to go away in Acts chapter 1. It said, the angel said, this same Jesus shall come again as you have seen him go. One of these days he's coming back. And uh, I thank God that it's not hard for me because of the faith that I have in Jesus Christ and in who he is that he will come again just like he said. So I see in this, uh, this passage of scripture a preview of that special day. Now, I don't want to focus this morning on that prophetic aspect of this passage of scripture, although it is prophetic. He is coming back. I want to focus on verse 4 in our text that we read and uh, where it says, Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. I want to focus on that part. There are some places in life where we can be in a good place and if we recognized it as a good place, we too could say, Lord, it's good for us to be here. It's good for us to be here. But sometimes we go through trials and heartaches and tribulations. We have a few mountaintop experiences, but then we sometimes go into the valley, don't we? And when we go into the valley, it's harder for us to say, it's good for us to be here. When you're in pain or in financial distress or you've got family problems, it's hard to say, Lord, it's good that I'm here. You might say, boy, I don't think it's good at all. But I want to speak this morning for a while on how to recognize that you're in a good place. How to recognize that you're in a good place. There's some places it's just not okay to be. <laughs> and sometimes we recognize those, but sometimes we're in a place where we, it may be a good place and we just don't know it. There's some places we know we shouldn't be there. I took a truck to New York City years and years ago. It was a tanker truck. And drove through Washington, D.C. and trying to take pictures of the nation's capital and got stopped by the police and run out of Washington, D.C. They said, man, you're not supposed to be here with that truck on Pennsylvania Avenue. <laughs> I started saying, well, Cousin Bill down at Little Rock said it was okay. <laughs> I thought that wouldn't go over too good. So they ran us out, stopped us in six lanes of traffic, turned us, made us do a U-turn in Washington, D.C. and take that tanker truck out of D.C. Well, we were headed to New York City and we got there. We stopped and went to church on Wednesday night with Brother Mel Brindley up in Maryland and then we drove on into, into New York City. And I wanted to get there in the middle of the night because I knew the traffic would be furious and I, that was my first trip to, to uh, New York City. And so we got there about 2 o'clock in the morning and uh, Brother Aaron, my son, was with me and he was just a kid at the time and, and uh, I'm praying for him to grow up still yet. <clears throat> We, we pulled into D.C., man, you see those lights of the city, like a big cliff in the background, lights shining. and Man, it was awesome. It was breathtaking. It looked like, it was like being at the edge of the Grand Canyon at sunset, man, it was just breathtaking. So we, uh, we picked out a lane and started driving into the city. And, man, those lanes kept spreading out, and you got about eight or ten lanes going into the city. And, and we got all the way going across Brooklyn. And uh, I was looking for an address that I didn't have a clue where we were going. I, I mean, how, how do you just start driving in New York City and hope you turn up at the right place, you know? And uh, I had a map, but, man, it's hard to look at a map and drive in city traffic. And so uh, uh, we're going across Brooklyn. And uh, we get up uh, all the way, went way too far. And uh, even at 2 a.m., the traffic is still pretty heavy. And so got up to the Triborough Bridge and uh, got forced over into a lane there. That's before I learned how to root them out of the way, Brother Danny. <laughs> and so going into uh, to, uh, Brooklyn and got there uh, to the Triborough Bridge and got forced to exit off and uh, to cross that bridge. And so I pulled into the booth. You have to pay tolls in New York City. 
man, lot, anywhere you go, you ought to pay a toll there. And I don't know, it was like, it was 12 or $24 or something like that for a big truck to drive across the Triborough Bridge. So I stopped at the booth to pay her. I said, ma'am, I didn't mean to turn here. I need to turn around and go back. She said, there's no place to turn here. And I said, well, can I just go and turn around and come back somewhere where I can find a place? She said, after you pay. <laughs> I said, but I don't want to be here. She said, too late now. You're holding up traffic. Give me the money. And so I had to hand her the money. She said, I'll tell you what I will do, though. She said, if you go over there and find a place to turn around, when you come back through, if it's less than 12 minutes, I'll let you go back through. If you'll come to my booth, she said, I'll let you go back through for free, and I won't charge you coming back. I said, good, I'll be right back. And so I took off. I had no idea that that was not a truthful statement. <laughs> be right back in New York City. There's no such thing. <laughs> and so got over into the Bronx. And if you've ever been to New York City, you know that's not a place you want to be. <laughs> and I got into the Bronx, and I'm, everything's one way. And we're driving a bigger truck, you know, and trying to find a place to turn around. I pulled over to the curb, and... And I told Aaron, I said, I got my atlas out. This was before we had iPhones and map, electronic maps and stuff. And so I, I said, you watch. We're in a bad place. You could see the uh, unsavory element of the Bronx. I mean, there were people out there uh, staggering along the streets. And there were people that looked like they are just looking for somebody to kill, you know. <laughs> and so I pulled over to the curb. I said, you watch the rearview mirrors for me. And I'm going to look on the map and see where we're, see where we're at and where we want to go. And uh, so I opened up the atlas, and before I could even find our spot on the map, he said, Dad, there's somebody coming up beside us on this side. So I, I had it started already, and so I shoved it in gear and took off. And uh, we drove a little further and pulled over to another curb. I said, watch again. Maybe we can get away from those guys. And we didn't know if it was drug pushers or prostitutes or killers, serial killers or what, but there, there were people all over the place at that time of night. And so we pulled over another curb, and... And just about the time I got the book open, he said, Dad, somebody's coming up on this side of the truck again. And so we took off. I said, well, we ain't going to be able to look at that map. You know, somebody's going to kill us before we get a chance. And so we, we drove a little further, and uh, I, saw, I saw a police car following us. I thought, well, great, they're probably going to pull us over, and then I'll get to ask him how to get out of here, you know. And so the police car, he didn't want to stop us. I mean, here we are with an out-of-state truck and a big truck in the middle of the Bronx, and he just shoots on around us, and I flashed my lights at him, and, and he began to slow down. I pulled up beside him and rolled the window down. And he said, yeah, what can I do for you? Two police officers. I said, well, we're trying to get out of here. We don't know where we're at and not sure we know where we're going, <laughs> but we're wondering if you can tell us how to get back out on the main freeway. He said, well, you go up here, take, a, take two rights, and then go back to such and such street, take a right, and you'll come back out on the Triborough Bridge, cross through the Triborough Bridge, get on the LIE, and I said, wait, 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 wait. None of those things make any sense to me. <laughs> I don't know what you're telling me. He said, well, never mind. He said, just follow me. I'll lead you out there. And so we rolled up our window, and here this cop took off. <laughs> Bam, he's out of there. Squealing tires, taking off, and he's running stop signs and stop lights. And, and he said, follow me. So I did. We're running the stop signs too. <laughs> and, and we're going like crazy out of there. And he finally gets us up on top, and and we're right there at the Triborough Bridge again. And so he stops right in the middle of the, of the lanes of traffic. And there's a, like eight lanes of traffic there. And he just stops and rolls down his window. You know, they're not, I think he'd been doing the deep breathing exercises. So he wasn't stressed at all. I was a little stressed. <laughs> and so he rolled down his window and pulls up beside of me. He said, where are you guys from? I said, well, we're from Arkansas. And we've never, we've never had this kind of traffic to deal with in Arkansas. He said, well, I'm from upstate New York, and I grew up in a place where we didn't have traffic like this either. He said, if you go right over there, go through that toll booth, you'll be back out on the main freeway. And uh, he said, you'll be going again. And I said, well, thanks, officer. And we talked for a little bit, sitting there, cars going around us, thousands of them, and, and we're sitting in the middle of traffic talking. And he finally says, uh, goodbye, and have, a, have a good evening. And he said, by the way, he said, before you leave, he said, do you know where you were? And I said, I think we're in the, in the Bronx. He said, yeah, you're in the Bronx. And he said, you ain't got no business here in the daytime, let alone this time of night. I said, believe me, we don't want to be here. <laughs> and he said, well, go over there and cross that bridge and you're out of here. So we took off and we're gone. I knew we were in a place we didn't need to be. I just didn't know what to do about it. Sometimes you're in a place you don't know where you are and you don't know why you're there. You just know you want to get out and 
That's not the case with this, these disciples. They were in a place that Jesus wanted them to be. And I want to help you in this message to know when you're in a good place when you see it. You're in a good place when you see it. You might be in the valley, but that valley might be where God wants you to be. Number one, how to recognize a good place is when you can examine His Glory. Look again at verses 1 and 2 in chapter 17. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them into a high mountain apart. And he was transfigured before them. And watch this. His face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Hey, you can examine the glory of Jesus when you're in a place like that. And when you get in a place where you can examine the glory of God, you're in a good place. If you can see the glory of God, I'm not talking about whether you can see a glowing light on somebody's face. I'm talking about when you experience the glory of God. Hey, when you come to a place where people worship the Lord, people sing, people shout, people have a good time, the word of God is preached, you might be in a good place to see the glory of God. There was a special people there on that Mount of Transfiguration. There was a special people. There were three guys. Look, how many, how many original disciples did Jesus have? Twelve. And there's only three of them here in this account. Three guys, they formed an inner circle. You know, I said earlier that the rich get rich and the poor get poorer. It's the people who stay close to Jesus and experience and live through the glory of God that seem to get chosen to be in a place where they can see more of His glory. There's only three disciples here. They formed the inner circle of those disciples. Now, it doesn't mean that Jesus loved them more than He loved the other guys, but it's just that when you love Jesus more than anything else, it's how you respond to His love that gets you selected to get a little closer. I don't know about you, but I like being in a, in a place where I can get close to Jesus. I like to be a, in a place where His glory shines forth. And that's why we say, hey, if God touches you during a service, don't be ashamed to say amen. And if God touches you during a service, don't be afraid to make a decision because you can trust God to do the right thing with you. And these three guys were responsive to the love of Jesus. Secondly, they were not only a special people, they were in a special place. The Bible says here in verse 1 that it was a high mountain. You see that in the Bible there? It's a high mountain. Later on when Peter wrote, Peter wrote First and Second Peter, remember that? And when he wrote in his epistles, he wrote about this very experience. In 2 Peter 1, 16 through 18, he calls it a holy mount. Think about that. Any place where the glory of God is present can be a holy mount. It can be a special place. I want to be in the place. I want to be under the spout where the blessings are falling out. And that's what they experienced here. And old Peter just wanted to kind of settle down and stay there. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? He got in a place where he, where he knew the blessings were flowing. He knew it was a special place and a special people. And he wanted to stay there. And sometimes you can be in a place where it's a special place, but you don't recognize it as such. And then thirdly, there's a special presentation that took place there. The Bible tells us in verse number 2 there that Jesus was transfigured. See that, verse 2, and was transfigured before them. That word transfigured is a word that means uh, it, it's like a metamorphosis. You know, you've ever seen a cocoon where a little larva is in the cocoon and, and eventually it, it begins to grow and go through a change and it finally it finally chews its way out of that cocoon and becomes a beautiful butterfly? Well, that's what happened to Jesus on that day when he gave these people and us, as we read it, a preview of his kingdom. He was metamorphosized into a glowing, transfigured person, the king of the universe. And 
that's what metamorphosis is, is a change. You know, it's not the first time it took place with Jesus, though. It took place in the womb of a virgin in Bethlehem. You know, Jesus existed before Bethlehem, right? He didn't come into existence at Christmas. <laughs> He's always existed. He's the king of the universe. He's the maker of everything that's made. He's the creator. And what happened in the womb of the Virgin Mary was a metamorphosis. God became a man. Why did he do that? So he could experience what you and I experience without the sin nature and then he could die for our sins and become who he is now today and who he will be as our king in the future. So that something special took place there. When you find yourself in a place where you can examine his glory, you're in a good place. That's why I tell people, hey, we don't go around trying to rob people out of other churches. We want to win brand new people to Jesus Christ. But sometimes people come from an old dead church to a live church because they want to see something happening. Nobody likes to be hypnotized and put to sleep in a church where nothing's going on. I mean, there ought to be some preaching. There ought to be some shouting. There ought to be some praising. There ought to be some worship. There ought to be some people getting saved. There ought to be people getting in the baptistry once in a while. We ought to see something happening in church if God's involved in it. And that's what these disciples saw. They examined his glory there. And number two, you're in a good place if you can exalt his greatness. What happened up there? When two people showed up that hadn't been around for a while. Moses died 1,500 years earlier, but he showed up that day. That's, by the way, as a side note, that is another proof that when you die, you don't go, your whole body and soul doesn't go to a grave to be there until the resurrection. Your body goes to the grave, but your spirit goes to be with the Lord immediately. And uh, Moses' spirit showed up on the Mount of Transfiguration that day, and so did Elijah. Moses died in the Old Testament just before the children of Israel crossed over into the Promised Land. Remember, uh, God buried Moses on the top of Mount Nebo. God himself buried Moses. What an honor. <laughs> and Elijah... I think Elijah here represents those Christians like us today <coughs> who never will die, but if they do die before the resurrection, they'll be, they'll be taken up. I think, he, I think he represents maybe a group of people that's going to be raptured. Elijah didn't die. He was taken up to heaven in a whirlwind never went to the grave. Moses went to a grave and was resurrected. Elijah went up in a whirlwind and was raptured. And so that covers all of us. Everybody who's saved, if you end up going to a grave like Moses did, God's going to raise you up someday if you're born again. If you're alive when Jesus comes back, then you're going to be caught up like Elijah did without having to die. I'm not looking for the undertaker. I'm looking for the upper taker. <laughs> well... They had some heavenly visitors there, and that makes it a pretty special event and a pretty special place. And then there was also a heavenly voice that took place there. I mean, who, who's heard God's voice audibly today? He speaks to me sometimes in my heart, but I've never heard God's voice out loud. Well, they heard a voice from heaven, and I'm looking for the voice of God whenever I can hear it. And I can hear the voice of God whenever I read His Word. You can hear the voice of God when somebody preaches or teaches the Bible, when you read the Bible. By the way, I'll just say this. Some people think that every impulse they have inside must be from God. Just because you thought it doesn't make it so. And every, every impulse that comes through your mind doesn't necessarily come from God. And so you can hear voices uh, that may not be God at all. I heard the funny little story about the guy that wanted to go ice fishing. And so he, 
he went and took his saw and took his reel and rod and some bait and he went and found some ice and he cut a hole in the ice and dropped his fishing line down through the hole in the ice and he heard a voice from up above. The voice said, there is no fish under there. And he looked around and he couldn't figure out where it came from and so he dropped his hook back in the water through the hole in the ice and that voice said again, there are no fish under that ice. And by this time he's getting concerned and so he looks up and he said, Lord, is that you? He said, no, it's the owner of the ice skating rink. You know, just because you hear a voice doesn't mean it came from God, does it? And so I'm saying that because some, sometimes people think just because they have a thought that they think it must be God speaking to them. The way you know if God is speaking to you is look and see if it lines up with the Bible. God won't ever say anything to you different than He's already said right here. Get some wise counsel from somebody who knows the Word of God instead of going off on your own and ending up fishing in a dry hole. <laughs> so let me take you to the, the third thing and we'll be done. You can experience His grace. It's a good place if you can experience the grace of God there. In verses 6 through 8 in our text, it says, And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. They fell down on their face in fear. And sometimes we may have the wrong kind of fear of God. It's good to fear God, but it has to be a reverential fear, not a trembling fear that he's just looking for somebody to beat up. And so we're looking for the grace of God. And if you're in a place where you can experience the grace of God... Even if it's a valley, it can be a good place. Even if it's a place where there's pain, it can be a good place if you can experience the grace of God while you're there. Jesus came and touched these guys. Now, they had, uh, they had fallen on their face. They're afraid. Jesus walks over and touches them and says, Be not afraid. That's grace, isn't it? When Jesus says, Get up, it's okay. It's all right. No need to be afraid. Now, they opened their eyes. and One of the other passages says that they had a deep sleep to fall upon them. So when they opened their eyes, they see nobody but Jesus. Moses is gone. Elijah is gone. Jesus only. You know what? When it's all said and done, you know, Jesus needs to be center of our attention. When it's all said and done, it needs to be him. Hey, when, when Peter said, this is a good place, and then he had that hoof and mouth disease, he was always sticking his foot in his mouth. About the only time he took his foot out of his mouth was when he was going to interchange it with the other foot. And uh, he's kind of like us sometimes. We open our mouth before we put our brain in gear. We'd be wise to think before we talk. <laughs> and Peter said, it's a good place. Well, it was a good place. But then he said, let us build three tabernacles, one for you, Jesus, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And that's when God said, wait a minute. That's not necessary to compare Jesus to Moses and Elijah. There's only one Jesus. And he's far superior to Moses and Elijah. And that's why God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Well, that's who we need to hear in our life. We need to experience His grace. Peter missed a few good things along the way, but he got one thing right. They were in a good place. And I'd like to ask you that question today. Are, are you in your life in a good place? What you're going through, you might not think that's a good thing, but is it a place where you can examine His glory? Is it a place where you can exalt His greatness? Think about how great he is when he pulls you out of that place eventually. Are you in a place where you can experience his grace? The answer to these questions may be yes, and if so, it's good that you're in that place. But if you're missing out on one of those things, 
need to get in a good place. Mel Trotter was an alcoholic. Wasn't even saved. Mel Trotter was a drunkard, and he would uh, take the money that he should have been spending for groceries on his family, and he'd buy booze with it. And he stayed drunk all the time. And he squandered the money that he had saved up for a horse and bought a round of drinks for his buddies at the bar. And when he came home from a drinking spree, he'd been drunk for 10 days and <coughs> he'd promised his wife time and again that he'd give up drinking for her and the baby, but he didn't. He'd always end up drunk again. He'd been drunk for 10 days and he came home and found his wife crying and the baby was dead. And he swore on the baby's casket at the funeral that he'd give up drinking. But within two hours, he was falling down drunk again. He tried to convince himself that he was no good and just ought to kill himself for a long time, but he just never had the guts to do it. But after this, after he'd broken his vow on his baby's casket to quit drinking, he finally decided it was time to end it all. And so he was walking, lived in Chicago. He was walking on his way to drown himself in the chilly waters of Lake Michigan. And in his despair... On his way to commit suicide, he went by the Pacific Garden Mission where the gospel was preached. And he, as he was passing by the door, a man stepped out on the sidewalk and to speak to him a little bit and prayed with him and said, God, I wish you'd save this young man from his misery and from his sin. And he talked the young man, Trotter, into coming in to hear the message, and so he did. And he went in and sat down and and that same man that had just prayed with him and testified to him, he himself had been a drunk before he got saved. And he went up to, to the platform and gave his testimony about how he had about come to the end of his life and he got saved and God changed his life. Mel Trotter heard that and then he heard the preacher preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, how Jesus bled and died on the cross of Calvary for everybody's sin and everybody could be saved if they'd just trust him. He heard that message that night and he went forward and received Christ as Savior. God saved him gloriously and he never drank again from that day on. After he got out of that valley because he had Christ on his side, never to be drunk again. His wife was so proud of him. And eventually he became the head man at the Pacific Garden Mission himself. He preached all across America. Thousands of other drunks came to Christ because of his testimony. He was in the depths of the deepest valley, ready to die because he was so worthless. And then he found Christ, or rather Christ found him, and he got saved that night. You know, as bad as that place seems, a place of despair and discouragement, and despondency and wanting to die at your own hand, that seemed like an awful place to be, but it was exactly the place where Mel Trotter needed to be that night. And as he was on his way to commit suicide, God placed him right in front of that place where he could hear the gospel preached and he got saved. So wouldn't you agree that that turned out to be a good place? On his way to kill himself, but it turned out to be a good place because now he lives in heaven because of what happened that night. Would you bow with me in prayer, please? And after we pray, we're going to have a verse or two of invitation and you can come and pray at the altar if you need to. Let's pray together. Father, we do love you and thank you for this picture of the kingdom <coughs> and the king. <coughs> and Lord, we, we thank you that 